Well, hello, and welcome back to Brave New Teaching, and welcome to season four of this cute little podcast. I am so excited. It is 2022. Amanda, we've made it. We have made it to season four. And Maria, I was talking to my mom the other day, and I was like, every episode that we've produced has come out during the pandemic. Yeah, no, they're excited. Like, to see if there's a future outside of pandemic teaching for this podcast. I really oh, hope there 100%. is. hundred percent. Yes. I mean, and we know that there is because we are enjoying what we are doing a little bit too much uh, for mm. there not to be something outside of pandemic podcasting. But I will say that it is funny that I, I was thinking about that exact same thing the other day. Like, wow, Amanda and I have put together a lot of like, we've built a whole brand of Brave New Teaching when we were virtually doing instruction and then like coming back hybrid and like all of the craziness. And this has been a thing that has really grounded us and kept us in not just our why for like business and things that are outside of the classroom, but like why we love working with kids and like why education is something that's such a passion for the both of us. This is something that's helped us through those really dark times that just keep happening. Like today or like keeping perspective, at least for me, I know I'm speaking for both of us because we've talked about this a lot, but like this has helped me keep perspective as to how much I love what I do in like a much bigger sense than the day to day. Like there's, there is a passion for this, that this podcast and creating what I've created with you has helped me. I won't say remember the whole time, but remind myself of when like (laughs) the days get dark. Yeah. And I think that's what our audience is feeling too. I'm just so grateful that we've found our people. You guys have found us. We've found you. Um, We posted a couple of days ago, a like back to season four real. Cause yes, we're going to step up our reels game. We're uh, working on, on it, Instagram. man. <laughs> and so many of you guys commented that you are original listeners. You've been here for a long time with us. And I hope that you're finding that too, that this is something that grounds us and amid the turmoil <laughs> that the very, like, that's like a really not aggressive word anymore. It's like turmoil is kind of like we can handle turmoil. Yeah. yeah no, um, that's pretty normal now. Through the turmoil, I mean, we found not only each other and just best practices, but I think we found what works and that teachers, we are freaking resilient in all of the non-cheesy ways that that word has been used. We are actually resilient. We are flexible. We are ready for change. We are so many things that the rest of the world doesn't really get to see, but we see that in each other. And I think that community, I, I don't know what where I'd be without it. Oh, absolutely. Well, and it's funny as we're talking about this is season four. I think a few people, if you're newer to the podcast, you're gonna be like, wait a minute. How is it season four? If you started in 2020 and it's 2022 right now, it's semester four, it's semester four, right? We are teachers and our lives revolve around a uh, school calendar. So we've just kind of taken on as a way to like chunk things up and make things a little bit more palatable, both for us as we're creating things and for you all, as you're listening We are going into our fourth season because we're going to our fourth term or our fourth semester of Brave New Teaching. It just makes, and we just like really like themes because we're nerdy like that. Okay, Uh, so there are some amazing things coming in season four. Absolutely. Do you want to start? Okay, one of mine is like, holy shit moments, because excuse my French, but we're going to hit episode 100 in season four. I feel like there are podcasts that I've listened to for a while that they've been like, Hey, episode like 80 episode a hundred. And I was, I was like, Oh my gosh, that's insane. This one is episode 79. Like we're, I think so. Yeah. This is insane. Just cause I think like, Oh my God, that's so many weeks. Like it doesn't sound like a huge number. (laughs) Then you think of like, that's like a lot of weeks of a weekly podcast coming out. And yeah, yeah. Episode 100 is coming in just a couple of months. And that's very exciting. And we've got some fun plans, like some giveaway, fun kind Mm -hmm. of little celebratory atmosphere going on around social media and the podcast for that. I'm excited for Shakespeare Teacher Festival 2.0. It's returning. Yes. Later this spring, we're going to have Shakespeare Teacher Festival 2.0. 2.0. If you were with us last year for our first Shakespeare Teacher Festival, we are so pumped and hoping that you will join us on the second half. We're going to have all new material, all new content. And if you missed the first one, that one is available. We really love what we do, obviously, as I keep saying. And this is one of those things that we nerd out about like a lot is bringing something like 
Shakespeare into a 2021, now 2022 classroom with real live children and telling you what works for us, what doesn't always work for us and like what some of our best practices and strategies are. It's so fun. We have some really wonderful interviews coming your way as well. We've been on a couple of other people's podcasts as well. So we'll certainly forward those along, but we're really kind of stepping into our collaborative game here. And we have just loved all of the opportunities to do that. And so we tried to reach out to some really unique people this season. Um, So you're going to hear today, actually, from a listener, we're doing an essential question workshop, which we literally are our favorite favorite. types of like (laughs) spitballing. We promise we'll bring you some other stuff too, but these are also what we get the most requests for are more essential questions, more questions regarding writing essential questions and articulating essential questions and using them in, in, in sentences, I almost said, using them in units and with students. And Amanda did a pretty great interview, yes, with one of our listeners. Why don't you go ahead and intro it, my friend? Yeah. So Taylor and I sat down, it was a couple months ago, actually, and we tackled an essential question for her Hunger Games unit. And I thought, you know what? Because she had sent me a DM and said, I was wondering if you could help me. And I think she really just wanted to like chat with me in my DMs. And I said, well, listen, I get this question all the time. Do you mind if we actually record this and share it with everyone else? Because I think a lot of people who ask this question would benefit from hearing our conversation. And I think that's what you guys really like about these workshops is that they are raw. They are starting kind of at zero and they're all the messy brainstorming pieces of this process that you get to hear rather than feeling like, oh, Amanda must just roll over in the morning and EQs just pop into her head. And, you know, Marie does the same thing, except that for her is in the shower. Yeah, it's not, it's not magic like that. I mean, sometimes there are EQs that just come out of nowhere. Um, but this, this process and this episode that you're going to hear right now is the dirty, messy, not stilted version of what it's like to come up with an essential question. Yeah. The last essential question workshop that we did like this was with one of my courses was with, well, the first one we did was with my 11th grade American literature course. And the last time that we did this in season three was with my 12th grade world literature course. And just being able to like talk to somebody else and get that good sounding board is something that I know helps me and so many of you out there being able to hear the two of us and hear the way that we kind of spar a little bit, right? And just throw things back and forth, back and forth. If you are lucky enough to be able to have this kind of relationship in your building or someone someone that you get to talk to regularly that can help and support you in designing your courses, fantastic. Sometimes it does take hearing somebody else's thought processes to say, oh, that's how that kind of a brainstorm can go. It's just like the way that we would model for our students. And we feel like the feedback that we've gotten from all of you, our listeners on these types of episodes are what keep us coming back with more and more. So that is all to say, let us know what other sorts of workshoppy and those sorts of conversations you would like to hear because we're always having them. We just don't always record them. (laughs) And truthfully, that's also why we would encourage you to pass these episodes along. As much as Marie and I have this kind of dream floating around about writing a book, there is something that a PD book doesn't have that our podcast does have. And that is the workshoppy, as Marie used in perfect English, the workshoppy feel of a conversation is not something you get when you're sitting down with a bunch of flare pens and highlighters to read a PD book. And they're wonderful. I've read tons of them. Marie's read tons of them. But we know that like in the moment, raw conversation has a whole nother value, which is why we're here in the podcast world. And we would love for you to just continue supporting us through sharing these episodes with other people and helping spread the word that we can become an even better community, a bigger community. And you can find your people by sharing things with them that they don't have to read. They could just listen to this on the way to work. Yep. Or in their planning period, whether grading or what have you. So friends, We are so excited to kick off season four with this EQ workshop with one of our very own, Taylor, one of our listeners, our brave new teaching community. And she is talking to Amanda all about, what do you know, dystopia. So you know that we geek out a lot about two things, Shakespeare and dystopia. So we are going to talk about both of them in our very first episode of season four. We cannot wait for you to hear it. 
Like we said before, uh, let us know what else you want to hear more of or some different things. We are always open to those suggestions because we want to be here for you and making sure that we are providing things that you actually want and need. I think it's time. Amanda, you want to say it? Let's cue the music. You're listening to Brave New Teaching, and we are so much more than a podcast. We give teachers the inspiration, support, and tools to challenge the status quo. I'm Amanda, and I'm a former English teacher from Illinois. And I'm Marie, and I'm a teacher from Southern California. Join us at bravenewteaching.com to find out more about our courses, festivals, and get every episode's show notes. We're so glad you're here. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a very special episode of the Brave New Teaching Podcast. I am here today interviewing Taylor, who is going to walk us through some of the things that she's thinking about that need some tweaks in terms of a unit essential question. And I am just so pumped because I think teachers all across America and the rest of the world have been asking questions about how to kind of fine tune and revamp a unit just by tweaking that essential question and getting it really to a place where both teachers and students are feeling invigorated, curious, and ready to rock and roll. So Taylor, welcome. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about you and where you teach? Yeah. So my name is Taylor. I am a fourth year teacher in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I teach at a small private school almost that has grades K to eight, but I teach grades six, seventh, and eighth grade English. So this unit in our curriculum, we use the Pearson curriculum is called taking a stand, which I love because okay. my eighth graders are very opinionated and they love to take a stand. Yes. Um, so the stories that are in the curriculum are fine, but I really love to use this unit to read The Hunger Games as a class novel, which is always a fan fave. The girls love the love. Yes, <laughs> and they the do. boys love the, the gore. I think Hunger Games is a great choice. So, the, so when you say Pearson, do you are you using a textbook or you have what do you actually have from Pearson to work with? So we have their their textbook set, my perspectives. It's my perspective. Okay. So I've heard of that. I've never used it, but I've heard. Okay. I'm writing that down. Okay, good. This is our second year using it. It's fine. (laughs) It's it's something to build from. So it sounds like you you knocked into Hunger Games. The kids love Katniss and her very multifaceted, very real, right? Like I have this romance, but I'm also a badass independent woman. Like what, how do I negotiate that world? That's awesome. And you've been teaching Hunger Games for four years. Or this is my second year teaching Hunger Games. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about this unit. So the the curriculum gives the essential question: When is it right to take a stand? Okay. I like it, but I want more. Like I wanted to be more focused, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, and what I really wanted to focus on is rebellion. So when I did this uh, unit last year, I gave the kids four topics. And as they read through the book, I had them pull out like examples of it. So I think I gave them wealth, rebellion, government, and there was one more. Um, And it really worked well. But the kids who did rebellion, their work was was amazing. And they were the most engaged with the book because they could find the, the best moment. So I really want an essential question that kind of builds in rebellion. So then I can also tie it with different articles about like what's going on in the world. Um, that's all. (laughs) That is amazing. So, okay. So whenever I do an essential question workshop, I'm really looking for three things. You've Mm -hmm. given me two out of the three, and I know you have the third one because we've kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, so essential questions are really best derived from the trifecta of texts, themes, And the last one is skills. So I need to ask you about your end of unit uh, summative. What is that assessment that your students are going to work on to end out the unit? Do you already have that planned or is that something that you're wanting to want to flex? Yeah. So um, with this unit, I really like to end it with a literary analysis, literary essay. And this is the second one they do. They do one with Anne Frank and it always works out very well. So I want them to write a literary essay kind of analyzing the different elements of rebellion in the novel. And then in the end of the literary essay, tie in how they are going to 
rebel, if that makes sense. Okay. They are going to Applying it to themselves. Apply it to themselves. There we go. I love this. Okay. So we've got a lot to work with here. So I'm going to kind of unpack for listeners what uh, what's going on up here in my head <laughs> as I'm <laughs> listening to you, Taylor, because this, this stuff is, is so good. So I love that you've taken this, that what Pearson gives you, when is it right to take a stand? That is not a bad question, but I think to your point, since you've narrowed down the fact that the idea of rebellion itself is a bit more juicy, that is a really good move because take a stand is still pretty vague and not really something that kids can always sink their teeth into. So you have that advantage of knowing that this word, this concept of rebellion is something that kids really, really are, are clinging to, are engaged with. And like you said, also, you know, that there are plenty of examples of rebellion in the rest of the world, nonfiction, current events. Um, what I also love about rebellion that's coming to mind for me is that there are definitely conditions and places where it is considered a very good thing to be rebellious. And there are conditions where it is a very negative thing to be considered rebellious and those conditions can change. So knowing that, that is all of the workings for a really juicy, essential question. So my kind of, my head is, is very much in, when we talk about text themes and skills, my head's very much focused on that theme of rebellion being, or that topic of rebellion being the guiding factor. Literary analysis is a great skill to have for a, when you want the essential question to be really niche because they're going to use textual evidence. They're going to back it up with literature. Boom. Like there's nothing, there's nothing about the skills of literary analysis that really need to be like part of the question. So I wouldn't worry about that. And then hunger games, like we know, like those are just like, boom. And even, even if, if listeners wanted to use this with pretty much any dystopia, like I think we could swap out Fahrenheit would work with a rebellion question. Divergent would work with a rebellion question. Grace year would work with a rebellion question. So that's kind of nice too. Cause if you ever decide to do like lit circles instead mm -hmm. of hunger games, this essential, whatever this is probably will still work. Mm -hmm. Um, because that is rebellion is a core element of dystopia, right? And a dystopian protagonist for the most part. Well, hello, brave new teachers. Pardon the interruption. I wanted to invite you all to a pretty cool opportunity. Some of you have already had this and some of you have just heard us talk about it quite a bit. Amanda and I have a masterclass that is all about uh, designing and delivering formative assessments to students in ways that are really useful and purposeful and extremely equitable and inclusive in our classrooms. And so I wanted to make sure that you all have the opportunity to join us. It is our masterclass called Down With The Reading Quiz, Formative Assessments for a New Generation. And it is something that we put together, gosh, almost a year and a half ago, where we go through three different types of formative assessments that we use in our own classrooms that provide quite a bit of equitable and inclusive feedback for us and for our students about what students are actually really learning. We show you how to design and create and then implement and grade formative assessments that deal with students actually synthesizing information instead of regurgitating what they think you think they should know, but actually showing what they can synthesize. It also has different strategies for assessing analytical skills and then another strategy or two for assessing student writing skills in a formative way and all the while also assessing student understanding comprehension, whether that's reading or just understanding of a lesson. We give three different strategies for formative assessments. We absolutely love it. We have had hundreds of teachers come through this masterclass and say it is changing the way that they uh, approach assessment, formative assessment anyways, in their classrooms. And so we wanted to make sure that you knew about it. Uh, if you would like to register for free and actually watch it immediately, you can head to bravenewteaching.com slash masterclass or the show notes for this episode. Cannot wait to see you all there. Again, that is bravenewteaching.com slash masterclass. Join us for Down With The Reading Quiz and see the results in your classroom. Really change it all for the better. It is a true game changer. All right, back to the show. So let's talk about here. Okay, here are a couple of things I'm thinking. I really think you have two options. I think if in terms of question stems, we can go, is rebellion blank or blank? Mm -hmm. So a blank or an, an is blank or blank type of question is a conditional argument. So what the kids would do in that little analysis in terms of their claim would be, 
they would argue one or the other. And depending on the skills of your kids, right? And so some of your kids, it might be enough to just say one or the other and then prove it and let it go, right? It's eighth grade and and kids are all over the map in terms of their skills, I'm sure. So they could say, let's just say good or bad for now, right? They could say rebellion is a good characteristic and then they can prove it. Kids could do that and plenty of evidence to do that. But what you could also teach with a conditional question like that is when they write a claim to provide the conditions where that's true or where that could be false. So, right, so their claim and their paper could actually say like, In circumstances where the protagonist is oppressed, rebellion is a virtuous trait. Or if the situation is blank, then it is blank. But if it's not, then it's, you know, so kids could really either, they could get really nuanced with their claim, but you could also back off for kids who need just an either or. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be the best argument? Well, probably not. But like, are they still going to get the chance to write and learn how to use evidence? And yeah, like they're going to be able to do that. So that's one option. So we could, we could say something like, is rebellion a virtuous trait or a harmful trait? Like you can give whatever virtuous and harmful, like you can, some kind of language that's a good or good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. Does it, does it, protect a society or destroy a society? Does it, uh, you know, kind of give them those two extremes. And what's fun about that too, is like kids can also track where they felt at the very beginning. So if you throw that at them at the beginning of the unit, they'll give you some answer, but then ask them again after they've read hunger games and maybe their answers. Well, hopefully they will have conditionally shifted, right? Like they've come from a place of, yeah, yeah, be a rebel. And then you're like, oh, well, okay. Like that's a good idea in theory, but then you have to deal with all these other consequences. Like, are you ready to deal with that? I think we're all ready to cheer for Katniss, but like not a lot of us are ready to volunteer, right? (laughs) Especially kids. So how do you feel? How does that sit with you right now, Taylor? What are you, what are you writing down over there? I'm just writing down what you're saying. And I was also writing down instances of good and bad rebellion in the world of like different people I could pull in like Malala um, and that story of rebellion would be awesome to, to tie in here. Um, I love tracking how they feel before and after books. I love those conversations. They're like the richest. Yes, they are. And I feel like this would be an easy way for them to track like evidence through the novel. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what I was writing down. (laughs) I was writing down all of my little thoughts. Okay. So that's, that's beautiful. So like, so that, that's one approach. And so you're kind of getting what, what's kind of nice is like, if you think about it in terms of like the essay or the end product, what am I going to get with this question that helps you understand, like, is this where I want to be for the unit? Now, as you're talking, I'm thinking about like the courage it takes to be a rebel. Um, mm. cause you think about the Capitol, how many people in the Capitol are watching this, but like have not had the courage to break that status quo. So like, but that to me is like a much more like cerebral, maybe high school type of question. And it's not that, and if those other good questions come to mind during the, it's not that you can't ask them, right? An essential question, it kind of is, is has to also be functional to to connect all the pieces. So um, I think that that's a great option. So, okay. So that's one option. Okay. The other option for you is to use a, to what extent question. Mm -hmm. So similar but the, the before and after looks a little bit different because to what extent would ask students to define a place on a scale and defend it. So there's really not going to be those conditions we talked about. They're going to say, um, and this is a little bit harder, I think, because you don't get the either or, right? You don't, the kids don't have that. Like, I can't just sit in one spot. So it kind of depends on where, you know, you think you, where the unit is in the year, right. If they're ready for it or, you know, kind of where kids are in terms of writing, but to what extent question would let you say to what extent is rebelliousness a virtuous trait or to what extent are people capable of rebellion? Uh, To what extent does a society require rebellious citizens? You know, because then that shifts I think the difficulty of what it is you're going to be asking kids to look for and see in the novel. So how do you feel about it? To what extent? I mean, what does that kind of put in your mind? Uh, To what extent? So I, I think that I have a lot of kids that would really run with that question. And then a lot of kids who would really struggle with that question. Um, So I usually do this unit third quarter, like right after Christmas break where we've, We've talked about literary analysis and digging into books and 
And these kids I've had, I have them three years in a row. So they know me and what I'm going to throw at them. That's awesome. um, so I think I was trying to decide, like, would it be best to give some kids that question who could handle it and then give the other kids? But I would push them. If you feel like your kid's third quarter be ready to go, take them, mm-hmm. take okay. them in the way. And then the way you scaffold that, right? So if they're having a hard time with this idea of a scale, mm-hmm. the way you can back it up is you can ask them a different question, like just for practice, right? So to what yeah. extent should teachers be allowed to post their personal lives on social media, okay. right? So you can yeah. give them an example of a hundred percent, right? Mm-hmm every little thing, blah, 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 blah. What, you know, is that okay? What if we backed it off to 75% or like, or you even like kind of gave them like a physical, like a scale on the board um, with dots, right. And you show them like zero, 25, 50, 75, hundred, like give them percentages, do a little bit of math with them and then try to visualize, well, what do those, what does that look like? Because this Uh, is conditional, right. But it's just a different way of packaging it. Um, And I think it is more advanced and it's definitely a little bit more of a challenge. And what's cool about that is before and after it's a sliding scale. So you're definitely going to see the kids changing mm. their mind. Um, the other thing that's nice with that question. So let's, let's just go with the, the um, to what extent is rebelliousness, a virtuous trait? Let's, mm. let's say that that's, you can change all kinds of things for this question, but let's say virtue, we'll, we'll talk about virtue, right? Like mm. I think about Katniss and think she's heroic, right? Like she, she did the right thing because my perspective is in her narration, in her story. Right. And I'm a citizen. I'm not a, you know, a big wig. Um, so that's funny. Big wigs because everyone's wearing wigs (laughs) in the Capitol, right? Puns. Three (laughs) jokes for you guys today. Uh, so if you're going to say to what extent is rebelliousness, a virtuous trait, I can ask that same question and that use that same scale with Malala. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can say we can, we we can, we're going to focus on Katniss throughout the story, but you can re ask that question all unit long with Mm -hmm. all kinds of things that you're going to pull in. And even things that kids maybe are seeing in current events or books they've read before. Um, do they read diary of Anne Frank with you uh, also this year? Yeah. It's the unit before this unit. So (laughs) we can tie it all together. (laughs) Boom. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Anne Frank, I mean, think uh, even her, I mean, it's rebelliousness, but like man, just mm-hmm. the absolute, like, I, I, and I feel like that might be like a, a negative quality of, re- of rebels. Like I think to be a rebel, you really have to be able to put blinders on and not care or think what other people think about you. Yeah. Which could make you a pretty bad friend. It could make you like, not really that delightful to be around. You're probably not very well liked. Like, do you really want to live that way? I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. And Frank probably had a lot of friends. She seems like a pretty cool girl, but I think just in general, like just the absolute courage and fearlessness that it takes to be that type of rebel. You can even give kids different levels of rebellion, right? Like Anne Frank and Katniss Everdeen, like they're like next level rebels, but like, you know, kids who are coming to school and defying a dress code policy. Yeah. Is that rebel is that even rebellious mm-hmm. or is that defiant? Are they the same thing? So again, you have got yourself in a really good place. And I think that would be an awesome, how do you feel about this idea of, of making rebelliousness virtuous or heroic? Is that kind of the direction you wanted to go? I think so. Yeah. Cause I wanted to like a lot of my kids, they are very heavily or were heavily involved in like the black lives matter protests. And they are very into current events and talking about them and being involved. So I want to tie that in. And as you were saying that, I could think of all of my kids that come in and are like, this teacher did this. And so I did this and I'm like, I could tie it all together. You absolutely could. Oh, that's so cool. So I think, okay. So Taylor, I think for you, if your kids are ready to handle it, I would definitely give them a, to what extent question. And if, if they're struggling, just try to scaffold down. I would always try to give them the hardest thing you can, and then just watch, watch them grow. And, and if it's really, um, really above some kids' heads, you can Mm. still add the or to that question. Like at least when you're talking, right? You can say, because it's it's inherent, right? When I say to what extent is rebellion a virtuous characteristic or not? Mm -hmm. Right. So that you can kind of give them that help too, because they can say it's not. All right, well, you're maybe more on like the 50 to zero side of this scale, or someone else, you're maybe on like the 50 to 100 side of the scale. Like let's you know, and those examples that kids pull from 
the novel and what they've read, that helps them narrow down like where on the scale they are. Um, and if you get the chance to teach counter argument, a counter argument paragraph, you know, on its own, I usually like to blend that in, but that's a very like 11th, 12th grade skill. But if eighth graders can learn to write a counter argument paragraph, that would be explaining the leftover, right? Yeah. So oh my gosh, it'd be so cool for them to do that from like President Snow's perspective to answer the same question. I could see them getting really passionate about it. That would be amazing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Especially this group of kids coming in. They are very opinionated. So I could see them. Okay. So you got perspective, point of view and rebellion and how linked those two things are. I mean, I think that's, I mean, look at, you know, what happened in the U S in January. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's plenty, I mean, that might be a little bit too hot button, but I think that there's, there's a lot to be said for whose eyes <laughs> are right. And, and I think literary wise, I think it's really great for you to talk about, you know, if this novel was spoken through someone else's point of view and even the film does kind of a nice job of, you know, maybe pulling in film because film naturally kind of flows in mm-hmm. other perspectives um, mm-hmm. and looking at Katniss from president snow's eyes, totally different than us seeing the world through hers. Oh my God. This gets me so excited to do this unit now. (laughs) Yay. Okay. I'm so happy. Do you have any other, I mean, I know I didn't give you a question, but I feel like you've got a lot to play with. Do you have any other questions for me or anything you want to clear up or. I don't think so. As you started to explain this, the, to what extent question, it made so much more sense and I could definitely scaffold them. And I feel like there's so much more room to discuss with that question. So I think that's the one and I'm going to, I'll play with it and see how it works. And then after this year, if I need to tweak it a little bit, yeah. um, but I think, I think they're going to be excited to talk about it. <laughs> oh, yay. Well, you'll have to keep all of us posted. Um, and we would love to hear how things go and yeah, don't feel like you have to ask the question all the time. I mean, beginning and end is plenty. If you can do some more in the middle, that's great. Um, because rebellion's going to come into every conversation and they're going to be using that all the time. Whatever you do though, I would, my last recommendation would be to use whatever that scale is, like make a physical document, or I guess it could be virtual now too, whatever, but something that they're adding to as they read. Like I kind of stepped away from formal annotation practices. Like I don't have my kids write in books anymore. We didn't even have books last year. Um, but I try to make like an anchor chart almost. Mm -hmm. And then the kids are adding to their ideas about the essential question as they go throughout the whole book. So they're actually Mm -hmm. practicing like textual evidence, citing it and like having a bank of evidence somewhere instead of what we used to do for annotation. And I feel like I've had much better buy-in. I don't have to collect books and like grade their fake annotations. Um, and that's been really nice. (laughs) Yeah. I usually, I think I have a a document. It's an evidence tracker that, that I send out and they, they thrive with that. So we do that with Anne Frank so we can practice that skill too. Dude. Yes. Don't even change it. Do the same thing over and over and over again. Kids get good at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if your question is good enough and it changes, they're not going to get bored. They're going to be like, Oh, this is different. Yeah. Not different. <laughs> nope. Not at all. <laughs> Do your kids give you any trouble since they've seen the movie? Do they ever not read and say, I know everything I've seen the movie. I know people have told me that they've kind of ditched hunger games because of that, but I'm curious how your kids normally do. Not with the Hunger Games. I think they get more exciting. I did have that problem when I used to do a wrinkle in time. Okay. They would do this. They would do that. They would not want to read because they're like, oh, I already know. I don't need to read it. Like, no, it's so different. You have to read it. It It's so different. Uh, No, but they, oh my gosh. I had a boy last year who does not like to read, does not like to discuss, but he got so into the Hunger Games. It would come in and be like, I'm so sorry. I read 10 chapters ahead. Like, oh, Yeah. You're in big trouble now, buddy. (laughs) How dare you read? That's terrible. (laughs) When I, when I taught hunger games and that was before the movie came out, that's how old I am. Um, (laughs) it was one of the best books I ever taught because I think a lot of my kids came in like snotty, like you're going to give me this baby book. And I'm like, okay, go read it. And now tell me it's a baby book because it, Suzanne Collins is not messing around. That thing is layered. Mm -hmm. There, There is a lot to pull out there. And like the movie doesn't even like 
tip. I mean, it's a beautiful film, but I mean, there is a lot, a lot left out. You get, you give them one Sesame street quiz, Taylor, and you're going to know exactly who's watching the movie and who's reading the book. <laughs> I'm so excited to do the Sesame street quizzes. I, I have it saved and ready. This will be my Good first girl. year. <laughs> yeah, you'll know right away. Cause they're going to give you movie answers and you're going to be like, Ugh. All right. Now I know that these three kids, I need to talk to them before (laughs) class tomorrow and say, Hey, I've seen the movie too. Okay. (laughs) Good. I I have 10 copies of catching fire just because of this, because they're like, I need to know, are they in love forever? They're going to read ahead. Yes, 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 yes. I loved, I loved hunger games and catching fire. I did. I kind of lost it on uh, what was the third one? Oh goodness. Oh my gosh. I'm I'm totally, that's how much I lost it. Mocking Jay. There we go. <laughs> and then they made the movie two movies. Out. Oh, okay, whatever. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm an OG original first one. Hunger Games is just amazing. The the we love to talk about the propaganda uh, mm-hmm. at the beginning. There's a really cool the the movie right? The President Snow propaganda trailer that they show right before they choose the contestants is so amazing to talk about propaganda. So there is, it is an incredible book. Well, so I wish you the best of luck and I am just so grateful. Thank you for being so vulnerable and coming on here with us today and sharing your adventure with us, Taylor. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was amazing. And I am so excited to go think about this more. (laughs) Yay. Oh, good. Well, that is the best part. So I am just so thankful to have you today and we wish you the best of luck and thank you for being a listener. Thank you for all of the above and we will check in again soon. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Thanks again for listening to Brave New Teaching. We'd love to keep the conversation going over on Instagram. And while you're there, check out the links in our bio for the most up-to-date events going on in the Brave New Teaching community. Thanks for being here and have a great week at school.